to service members every day as long as this occupation continues. Next slide, please. At one point during the siege of Fallujah, it was decided that we were going to allow women and children to leave the city. We thought this was the most magnanimous thing we could have done, and yet our rules were, were uh, to let only women and children out. And so uh, any male over the age of 14, or as, as we were told, anyone who was old enough to be in your fighting holes, too old to get out of the city, was turned away. And so my responsibility during this time at, at certain points was to go out on this bridge and turn away uh, families. And like I said, we thought this was the most magnanimous thing we could have been doing. However, it's clear that we're giving these families an impossible choice, whether they could stay together with, the, with their families intact or uh, split their families up and, and hope that half of them end up with something better. But all that we had to offer them was literally the mosque across the street, good luck. And what happened there can only be described as either the deliberate or careless creation of internally displaced refugees. During the siege of Fallujah, Fallujah our rules of engagement changed uh, so often that we were often uncertain of them. And at one point, anyone who was described as a suspicious observer would be a legitimate target. Anyone holding a cell phone, binoculars, or uh, at one point, anyone out after curfew. And this led to an incident where Marines were firing at firefighters and cops silhouetted against a fire that uh, our uh, indirect fire had caused who were trying to help out the civilians that were being affected by that fire. Uh, after the siege of Fallujah, my team was tasked with setting up a, a checkpoint at the Civil Military Operations Center at Fallujah, where uh, we detained various personnel at uh, SNAP VCPs during the summer of 2004, many of whom were harassed unnecessarily. One uh, such, uh, such person had a bag of cash in his back seat and was harassed by uh, human intelligence uh, officers before being released. And uh, th their abuse of him was such that he, they were even reprimanded by a higher officer, but they determined that there was no reason to detain him and he was let go. Uh, if that money was not intended for the insurgency before this incident, I have to assume that it was afterwards. I realized that we in civil affairs were a fig leaf. We were there to make the occupation look good. We even came up with a slogan to justify our existence to the infantry commanders that we had to beg to be able to get out and do our missions. And it was, we care so that you don't have to. If there are any questions from members of Congress as to the particulars of any incident that I've mentioned here, I would be happy to provide names of all personnel and units involved, dates, and grid coordinates. I hope that my testimony has helped shed light into some of the shadows that make up our collective denial of the occupation of Iraq. As a country, we have allowed fear to overwhelm us and have failed ourselves by allowing this criminal occupation to have ever happened. You do not have to have served to see how recent pressures on the military are making us weaker as a country. You do not have to have witnessed the occupation firsthand to see its absurdity, and you do not have to be an expert on international relations to see the disastrous effects of our foreign policy. Ignorance, propaganda, and distraction have made up the last refuge of those Americans who would rather remain in denial about our current state of affairs. Now that we are facing the truth, and the majority of America is at least nominally against the occupation of Iraq, what fate will we claim for our nation? For some, their silence will be their hypocrisy, and their inaction will be their complicity with the destruction of our great union. But I have an unwavering faith in my country, and I know that the self-writing ship of the United States of America will one day regain its course, but only with the great toil, courage, and sacrifice that it demands of its winter soldiers. I am proud to call myself one of them today. My name is James Gilligan. I served a four-year and a two-year contract honorably for the United States Marine Corps. While on active duty, I achieved the rank of corporal and was promoted in the individual ready reserve to the rank of sergeant. I was deployed in Kuwait and later in the initial assault five years ago to Iraq for Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003 with the 2nd Marine Division, 2nd Combat Engineer Battalion, h &S Company, CEB Maine, and served as a member of the Nuclear Biological Chemical Reconnaissance Team for the Combat Engineer Battalion, Maine. Later in the same month of returning home, I deployed to United States Naval Base Guantanamo Bay, Cuba with 3-6 weapons, weapons Company, Cat Platoon. I was assigned to the Joint Operations Center and later on the fence line. I have personally observed Camp X-Ray from the outside and later once inside. In 2004, I was deployed with the same unit to Afghanistan in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. I have testimony on all three deployments to be entered into the records. However, today, in the message of solidarity with IVAW, we're only going to talk about and speak about Iraq. I am also uh, a number of that 120 a week. I, uh, in 2007, tried to take my life as well. I feel deep regret and remorse for what we've done in Iraq and uh, on the global war on terror. This is my testimony. 
Kuwait and Iraq 2003, the initial invasion was to be a mechanized breach or a miklik. It's a tub of C4 on a high tension rope with a detonation cord inside. It fires on a rocket over a minefield and is used in counter landmine warfare to make a lane which trucks can drive through. We practiced this maneuver twice in Kuwait and never performed it. It was on the oral history review DT. DSITAE015 conducted January 14th of 1991 an interview between Major Dennis P. Levin of the 130th Military History Detachment and Major Walter Wilson, Junior S3, 1st Battalion, 504th Infantry. It was quoted right away, Major Levin. The primary focus of this interview is the training relative to the Iraqi strong, strong point that was constructed on the Ali Range, and I am interested in what preparation you had before the training operation, and then if you could just kind of take me to the operation as it went. Major Wilson replied back with, the main preparation we did, other than issuing formal operations orders, was to rehearse it twice before we actually conducted the attack. And also we had about two officer professional development classes on the Iraqi strong point and what it consists of and how we would envision taking it down. This tactic was in the works prior to the invasion. Twelve years later, we were issued the same warning orders, and instead of breaching under fire, we breached the country twice by road, the second time by UN security car through UN back to uh, Kuwait and back onto the Iraqi roads. This was all due to the incompetence on the leaders of the uh, convoy commander. I am sure without fail that we were the only unit in history to have ever invaded a country and invaded it all in 10 minutes twice. It was then that we drove on through the day and continued unhindered for the most of the next two days while American air power pounded the hell out of Iraqi armor and buildings with depleted uranium rounds. The amount of destruction was tremendous, and we watched once while in a traffic jam as a pair of Apaches laid rockets and gunfire into the heart of a city a few kilometers in the distance. Without a doubt, I have been in and around buildings destroyed by depleted uranium rounds, as well as vehicles, armor personnel carriers, tanks, and corpses. During the invasion, we were also exposed to severe sandstorms, which meant that we were breathing in sand for days, sand that more than likely contained depleted uranium. I went for 47 days without a shower in the initial invasion, and I could buy a PlayStation 2 game in a post-exchange before I could even shower, because our contractors were already making bases and had a routine supply line while we were sleeping out in the open. Almost daily, I found Iraqis who spoke English, whose questions were who we were and how long we were to be there. Today is the Conscientious Objector Day, May 15th, and the day that honors the, those who choose not to fire their weapons. They do go to combat sometimes by force of their command. We were just a week before the flight to Kuwait when I saw my first sergeant chew someone out about his CO status. I heard the first sergeant say, what if those F blank ragheads came into your home and raped your daughter and tortured and murdered your wife? I was shocked to hear the bravery in the young Lance Corporal's voice as he told the first sergeant, no, I don't know what I would do. Why, would we do that to them? Destroying Iraqi property was such a pleasure for some, but for me one day it was orders. I was ordered to take Lance Corporal Jerome with me as security, and I received orders via inter-squad radio to destroy a civilian's pickup truck. I slashed as much as I could, and I kicked in the windshield for good measure. It was later with regret that I thought that this might have been this man's livelihood. Looting during the initial invasion was rampant. Nearly everyone had something. Rugs, pens, pictures, you name it. Anything you could find that would fetch a price. Later, I had to surrender to U.S. Customs officials, military liaison, my pins with Saddam's head and on the design. They wanted them back because all uniform items were to be confiscated for the rebuilding and reconstituting of the Iraqi army. Meanwhile, we were running over guns and blowing up weapons caches. Slides. Those that didn't brought their s bought their souvenirs on the street, some of which were probably stolen. That's a picture of me as a tunnel rat in Afghanistan. Next slide. For some members of my unit, it was the Iraqi Atomic Energy Facility that was most profiting. It was there that I was told that members of my unit had breached a safe containing gold coins. I was not on that foot patrol, which took place deep within the compound. However, I was shown the coins later from fellow NCOs in my platoon. When I deployed, it was with two sappy armor protective plates, yet I was ordered to give one to a fellow Marine from 1st Common Engineer Battalion who had not deployed with one. Such was the case for a majority of the junior NCOs and below from 1st CEB, deploying with inadequate armor. During the initial invasion, in fact, my Humvee had plastic doors. We never found evidence of weapons of mass destruction while on patrol with a nuclear biological chemical warfare chief warrant officer and fellow members of my reconnaissance team. Early May, while trying to win the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people, we were surrounded by a crowd of non-hostile Iraqis. I witnessed my first sergeant for H&S Company as he exited the Humvee without any backup or support. 